all the other does the same, but then all the process get the information. So all gather is like gather, but uh, instead of the information going to the single processor, all of them has it. And all to all is basically a mat matrix trans transpose. So if, if at the beginning each um, process has one row of data, after the all to all, each process will, will have one column of the original data. So this this row here is actually a column here. And this is the one that takes uh, all to all is the, the process, uh, the, the collective call that uh, actually uh, is um, squared um, based on the number of communication that the one that the number of uh, messages uh, grows as the square of the number of participants. Uh, so what do you need to know about MPI? MPI is the most important thing that you uh, need to look into and it's something that you will have to work with uh, every time you sit uh, on the HPC. Uh, it's available on all kinds of hardware, including laptops, not limited to uh, HPC systems. Um, and all compute nodes in the HPC system or cluster participate in a pool. An MPI decides which copy of the processor, which node uh, and core to send. Uh, so the, um, each copy of the process is identified by, its, uh, uh, by a number and it's called the MPI rank. And the rank is usually written in the log file, so it may uh, help uh, trace some kind of faults. And similar to thread affinity, the MPI system may have a way for you to specify process affinity. So which rank goes to which core on which node. Um, now, the program is usually run by MPI run the command, and you specify how many copies you want, and then you specify the command. We'll see later uh, this in action. Uh, on HPC system, this is usually not the case uh, because it happens through a job scheduler, like slow, but uh, yeah, uh, in any case, this command will appear somewhere. Now, the course of a node can also be used to API tasks instead of open MP threads. Uh, so if we have four nodes with 16 cores each, we can do the following, let's say, I want 16 threads on four processes. So I only have four distinct processes, but each of them runs 16 different threads. Or the other way around, I have 64 different processes, each one of them running one single thread. These are both possible as, as well as all the intermediate, uh, like uh, two by 34, uh, 32 or four by 16 or something else. And usually the first one is more beneficial. So the um, the rule of the thumb here is try first with uh, running as much MPI processes as there are nodes, and inside each node run as much threads as there are cores. That's usually the most beneficial, but not always. You have to try. So what you need to know, you need to know the number of nodes available again and the core socket configuration you need to know how to run MPI jobs particularly for uh, the HPC system that you're using the bus batch scheduler uh, syntax and how to query the scheduler for the status of your jobs uh, you need to know your software does it support multi-threading and if yes what is more beneficial to make um, as I said the number of ranks equals to the number of nodes and the number of threads equals to the number of cores if you doesn't support multi-threading, then just number of ranks is total number of cores. And lastly, um, you have to know the limitations of your software and the scalability, uh, how, how it scales. So you don't have to waste any resources um, because um, that's usually what happens. Um, also, as I said previously, there are GPUs sometimes on, on some of the machines and uh, compute not may have one or more accelerators. Uh, uh, the main problem with GPUs is that um, 
they don't have access to the same uh, RAM as the CPU. So if they need to work on a task, uh, you have to transfer the, the data from the CPU to the GPU, and that piles up on top of the NPI transfers that uh, is already needed between the nodes. And um, some systems support direct GPU to GPU transfers, which might be faster, but not always. Still, you need to ask for it if you if you if if you are on a system that has multiple GPUs on multiple nodes, um, you need to make sure that the software does or does not support direct GPU to GPU transfer because that can be faster sometimes. Now, uh, this last question, the limitation of the software and its scalability, this is a very important question and um, I will now turn my attention to the last part of this lecture, uh, which is uh, which regards strong and weak scaling. Uh, so let's uh, first say that a algorithm is of steps, uh, not much different from a cookie, and uh, some of the steps are independent of one another, uh, so can be executed in parallel. By independent, uh, step I is independent of step B if step B cannot influence step A's input in any way. There is no data dependency between them. Now, the, the portions of the algorithm that can be parallelized is called the parallel regions, and the rest are called the serial regions. So some things just cannot be parallelized. Uh, like a blunt example is that if you take several pregnant women, they cannot deliver a baby for one month, no matter what you do. Uh, now, the more time an algorithm spends in parallel regions, uh, the better it's suited for HPC, because at the end, that makes it more scalable. Uh, when we're talking about scalability, we usually introduce something called speed up, and the speed up is uh, uh, T1 over Tn, which T1 is the time for running the one processor, and Tn is the time for running it on n processors. So let's say uh, something that when I run it on one processor is uh, one core, let's say. Uh, it takes 10 seconds, but if I run it on cores, it takes one second. Then the speed up is... And this is the ideal situation when S equals N. So um, independent of N is, if, if the speed is uh, equal to the number of um, processes, uh, then we have so-called linear scaling, and um, this is the best we can hope for, but this is rarely achieved in practice. Uh, it happens for some small n sometimes that s is actually bigger than n, so uh, the speed up is, let's say, 110%. Uh, this is due to some kind of caching here and there and uh, it's fun, but uh, as I said, this usually happens for very small n, two, four, something like that. Now, Ambel's law is something that is uh, says uh, what time, can, what speed up can we expect from a, a program in which p is the portion uh, of the parallel regions. Let's say that seventy percent of the program is parallel, then the speed up that we can expect is this, uh, and as you can see, it depends on P and on the number of processes. Now, this is valid for a fixed workload, so we the thing here is we have a task, um, we have a problem uh, that we keep fixed, and we try to throw more processes at it. So, we try it on one processor, then we try the same problem on two processors, or four, on eight and so on, so and so. Uh, the dependence of the speed up uh, from the number of processes under fixed load, so for the same uh, problem we are uh, trying to solve, is called strong scaling. And um, if you go to Wikipedia for the, the page for Amdahl's law, you will see this um, particular graphic. And um, I want to um, point your attention to the green line. Now, the green line says 
a parallel portion of the program is 95%. And even if the parallel portion of the, prob the program is 95%, so only 5% of the program is not parallel, but is serial instead, we can see that soon uh, we, we don't have a speed up that is much, uh, that, that can go above 20. And even if we run it on 65,000 processors, it will still be 20. So it will be a huge waste of resources to try to run it on 65,000 processors. Um, I think this, this one, uh, let, let's say for eight processors, it has a speed up of six, which is okay. For 60 processors, it has a speed up of 11, which is again, more or less okay. For 32, it has 13. For 64, it has, well, 15. So now, somewhere around here, it's just not beneficial to do this anymore. You just need to stick with 16 processors and not try it on bigger number. And for even starker example, I want to show you this is something that I have generated with uh, myself. This is the portion of parallel regions here is 99.9%. .9%. So only one thousandth of percent serial regions. And this cannot go above 100, uh, 1000, sorry. The speed up cannot go above 1000 no matter what we do. So even on, on 30,000 processors, it's still 1,000. And it's the same on 25,000 processors, basically. And this is because when uh, n goes to infinity, s goes to 1 over 1 minus p. And so, yeah, it's easy to just uh, do the math yourself, and you'll see that uh, in that particular case, if p is 99.9%, uh, s goes... Uh, to 1000. So this looks very help, hopeless and discouraging, and uh, uh, it is. And the communication time, uh, which is most uh, notably, counts towards the serial regions. So uh, if you have any communication in the, in, in the uh, program that is not hidden behind some kind of computation overlapped, there is no hope for strong scalability. And I can see we're almost out of time, but I will uh, just say this. Uh, uh, I need to, to also say about Gustafsson's law and the weak scaling. And um, as I said, uh, uh, Andal's law is when there is a fixed workload. So it's, uh, we don't uh, change the problem size, uh, just throw more work at it. But there's another way to utilize the resources and that is to solve bigger problems. And this is where Gustafsson's law come into play. And this is valid for a fixed time, uh, but the workload and the number of processors vary. So uh, we have a fixed problem size per processor. So if we started with, um, uh, let's say a problem that is uh, uh, one, uh, uh, one unit big, uh, and run it on one processor, but then we uh, have a problem which is two unit big, two units big, but run it on two processor, two processors. Then we might expect to to have the same uh, to finish in the same time. And if we have a, a problem that is uh, 128 times bigger, but we run it on 128 processors, we might as well expect to have more or less the same time. Again, this uh, depends on the amount of uh, parallel regions in the program. P is the same as before, and N is the number of processors. And this works, this seems a little bit better. So uh, if we have 90, uh, this red line here at the top uh, says that if we have a 90% of uh, program is uh, uh, parallel regions, then um, on 120 processors, we should expect a speed up about 110, which is more or less good enough. Uh, so, yeah, weak scaling is generally easy to easier to achieve. Um, 
but then if the software uses some kind of naked collective API, all to all, for example, uh, weak scaling will be great as well. Um, also, the, the uh, not all, all algorithms are created equal. Uh, if an algorithm is uh, complexity is n to the third, uh, then we only get 26% of speed up upon doubling the resources. So not all algorithms behave well. Uh, usually the ones you will need though, uh, do behave well. Uh, so at some point it becomes worthless to throw resources at the given problem. Uh, and it's up to you to be able to judge that limit. And you will need to perform scalability tests. Run your simulation, but with only a limited number of time steps. Like if your simulation requires 50 million steps, don't run it with 50 million steps, run it with 100 steps or 1000. Uh, but then run it in different configurations, uh, different number of threads and MPI tasks, uh, increase the number of cores and nodes, uh, find out that it doesn't make any sense to increase them anymore. And when you have this scalability data, then uh, you know how much resources you will need. Uh, so to not to not waste any resources and then that's how much resources you will request for your final simulation well that was for me uh thank you for your attention um if you have any questions and i'm sorry i'm a little bit uh, above the time limit but uh, yeah it was a big topic thank you thank you very much Thank you very much for the systematic and nice explanations and for the good advices. Uh, a little bit over the time limit, but uh, on the other hand, facing a lunch break, so I guess we have some time for questions. Here is the first one. And using OpenMP and or I on a workstation under Linux to optimize performance, for instance, using Gromac, e.g. Xeon Core with NCPU and GPUs, or are they only beneficial for use in supercomputers slash processors? Oh, yes, sure. Uh, I'm, uh, if your workstation uh, or a Linux or a laptop or whatever um, supports um, has multiple cores, um, why not? Um, that's uh, that's totally acceptable, and that's what you uh, that's uh, what gets done usually because. Uh, uh, well, for for the limited number of cores you have, um, uh, for example, when we do some kind of programming in Gromax, because we did that uh, previously, uh, at least up to uh, four or eight uh, four or eight uh, API tasks or four or eight threads, uh, uh, we kind of perform this uh, um, uh, scalability test on the laptop than on the workstation themselves. Uh, but uh, when we need to place the scalability for a larger number, of people, then we just need to go to an HPC machine because there are just not enough cores. The, the, uh, definitely use MPI and OpenMP um, and laptops. Uh, just uh, don't go over the, the number of cores you have. That's definitely the one. OK. Then the next question from our attendees, when would you recommend close or red binding of uh, Depends on the software. Uh, I cannot recommend one over the other, but sometimes uh, um, if you, you just have to try which one works best software at hand, uh, because uh, you don't know uh, what the programmer did when when he wrote that region. So it's sometimes some software work better with close, uh, others with spread, but uh, it just depends on the, how the code was written. So unless uh, unless you have some kind of um, a documentation from the developers that says, uh, use that thread of um or the other, uh, you have to experiment. That's... Okay, thanks. I don't see any other in the chat. So thank you once again.